If we had fMRIs in all those people's brains, they're in the same state. That's called a polymonic state. Right? Thank you. I know it's a lot for just that little thing. It's supposed to be easy. You can see it big there. Polymonic state. There was another one where it's a bunch of people in the airport. And all of a sudden they're like, yeah! And they're a bunch of dolphin fans or something. And on the screen came a tie or some score or something. Polymonic states. Remember those states? What's the one we're seeking and the child is seeking in individual play therapy? Bimonic. It's called love. It's called bliss. We all seek that. Do you need the other one? No, it's okay. Thank you. God. So we got bimonic, we got polymonic. You just saw that. You witness that all the time. You go to concerts, you, do, you love that feeling. Esprit de corps. Um, unimonic. What's unimonic state? Home on the range. Mind, spirit, body, all one. Jung talks about that sense of individuation, that moment, this peak experiences, all that stuff. That's unimonic. Remember unidyadic? What's a unidyadic state? It's okay if you don't remember this. It's just my own. Culture um, separated from us that we still like admire and they don't know us. So like, for example, celebrities. Exactly. Cele exactly. Celebrities, heroes, all those people that basically personify unlived unlived aspects of ourselves that embody ideals we're connected to. That's really what all those celebrities, all that stuff is. Now in the age of Twitter, when you can follow all these celebrities, it makes them feel that much more real, that much more your buddies, your pals. It's a very strange phenomenon, that boundary between the private and the social, the separate individual and the together self is blurring a lot. So our heroes become our buddies and we really have these strange you need to add relationships with them. <laughs> okay. So significance, right? Involves what? You can look in the board. Time. Availability. You get some sense of what I mean by availability? It's a way of being in a relationship with a child that's real, but appropriate. Pain in the ass. You're not doing it for you. You are doing it for them. I swear to God, everything I say and do, really true. When I'm with a kid, there's way back there the observer that's saying, how is this good for this child? How is this good for this child? How is this good for this child? How is this therapeutic for this child? I might be barking at this kid, I swear to God. And I'm still thinking, how is this therapeutic for this child? Okay, so let's look at the domain of therapy because I think there are at least three or four, if you want to say legitimate, uses of the space. Now obviously the most conventional one, the one you always reflexively think of, is therapy as treatment, a cure for a disorder, a disease, a disturbance, a DSM-3 diagnostic category. Okay, I understand, that's the usual thought of therapy. And you're the provider of treatment of a cure to this disease, disorder, disturbance. Some kind of frequency, duration, and intensity of some behavior is bumming out some adult, whether it's a parent, a teacher, a law enforcement agent, something, that says this kid needs help Okay, perfectly legitimate. There's a diagnosis, insurance pays if they're lucky. There you have it. Two. I call it the pool cleaner model. Nothing wrong with the kid. The kid's a beautiful pool. Ah, living under a big eucalyptus tree. Divorce. Other kinds of difficult situations. He's a pool cleaner, like you, to come along and help clean out stuff. Also known as the garbage disposal, toilet bowl model. They dump things, and some of them really do. They'll dump things. You even have them write out a little something and fold it up and crumple it and throw it away in the garbage disposal, the big clunk -a chunker that sucks up all that negative stuff and they can let it go. Okay? Diagnosis, adjustment reaction. They're dealing with something in the environment. Insurance pays, maybe. 
garbage disposal, pool filter, toilet bowl, vitamin supplement. What? Again, I do tell kids as hokey as it sounds, and their parents as hokey as it sounds, as hallmarky as it sounds, that I am a care coach. I am here to help you take loving, responsible, respectful care of yourself. I'm here to help your parents help you take great care of yourself. I'm here to help your parents take great care of you. I am a care coach. Some kids are doing overall in the world just fine. They have a baseball coach. They have a bowling coach. They have a music teacher. You're more like a music teacher in this model. <clears throat> help them take good care of themselves. And I'm in their lives for a long time. That, that 21 year old now that I've talked to you about, she's doing great in her life. She doesn't need therapy as a treatment, a cure for disorder, disease, or anything like that. I'm a coach to her. I'm a significant other. By the way, as we sit here right now in Zimbabwe, in some little village in Zimbabwe, I promise you. And if there's any little Eskimo outlet out there in the North Polish area, way up there, right now as we sit here, some human being is talking to some other human being who's not related to them, who is deemed a shaman or priest, rabbi, some kind of special person that has some kind of knowledge of wisdom about life, and they're talking to them. We are the talking people. We are the storytelling people. We need to have that kind of connection and guidance. And all those folks, rabbis, priests, and all that, great, wonderful. We're also part of that tribe of folks. Takes a village, whatever. Well, that's a vitamin supplement. I tell parents this. It's a very legit, no, it's a luxury. Luxury. Insurance, there's no diagnosis. Insurance doesn't pay for that. But it's really important. It's a very legitimate use of this space. Alternative relationship. I told you the grandma says, I want you to help raise our child, my child. I said, wow, what a privilege. We'll do. Have been. Fifteen and a half, as I said. What a great moment when she comes in, shows me a learner's permit. With my dancer one, I'll never forget when she came in with a driver's license. I drove here on my own. Oh my God. The um, one that I'm help raising, when she was 10, her school was having a father-daughter dance. And she comes and says, I don't have a daddy. Would you be my daddy at this dance? And I said, I got to, I said, that's such an honor. So, I, I don't, I can't really put it in the words. Uh, I love you. <laughs> I'm committed to you. I'll be here for you throughout your life as long as I can. It somehow doesn't feel right to go to this dance with you. And I can put in the words. <laughs> I'm so sorry if you're disappointed. And she says, no, that's all right. I wasn't sure either. Cool. You can go anyway. Oh, yeah, I can go with so-and-so and her dad. And you can kind of be my name and blah, blah, blah. I always remember, if it doesn't feel right, just say that. You know, I can't put in the words, it just doesn't quite feel right. By the way, that's really important, the boundary issue, as we all know. You'll see me in the Carl tape, you'll see two times, where he, one of them actually don't see, it's off screen. You'll, he, he is just hanging on to me, just hugging me. Mm, and I'll say, oh, you're hugging me, it feels so good to be held. And, and then he starts exploring my face like a little baby. Now you're looking at my face. It's fine. And again, it'd be abuse if I didn't hug him back. It's not time to hug. But if they're over in your space, that's not what I'm saying. I understand it's fun for you. I understand you want to feel it. It doesn't feel comfortable to me. They start following you. Hello, you sexually abused kids. No, I understand you want to, but not OK. Appropriate boundaries. Alternative relationship. Let me give you another example. So this Asian family moves to the States. <laughs> this little three-year-old had, had never been outside, really, her two parents and her 
deeply devoted, deeply involved uh, extended family over there. So now, all of a sudden, they're here. Very bright people. This child now refuses to in any way engage with anybody other than the parents, doesn't want to leave the parents, doesn't want to go to daycare or any place else. Parents are very bright professionals. They need to, they're here for their work. What are they going to do with this kid? There's a latch on. Actually, in this case, I'm a transitional relationship. Comes in. Not only does the body speak humanese, play speaks humanese. I don't speak one word of Japanese. Shishi, is that Japanese? I don't know, I think maybe that's thank you. I don't even know, maybe that's Korean. No, komusimida is Korean for Korean. Anyway, I don't, I don't nah. So I see this kid, he comes in. Look at me, I look at him. To the ground, right? I'm going to form a bimonic state with this little pumpkin. I don't speak a word of what he speaks. But I see he's into the toys, so I just start with play. I see him in the toys, and he's handing me stuff, and we're, we're engaging. And after about session three, he wanted, I couldn't tell what he wanted me to do. And I, and I said, I see you're really frustrated, and I know you want me to, I just know. Move the bed! Finally said. I said, oh. But thank you for telling me in English. I'm so sorry to tell Japanese from move the bed. And I know you're so frustrated. I moved the bed. He started talking with me. And then he started talking with other people in the world. And initially, of course, he had to have the parents in the room. And very quickly, he didn't have to have them in the room. And I was the first, really, non-Haitian, non-Japanese person that he spent any alone time with. As I kind of tadpole him into the world. And I saw him for, now that was short, I saw him for maybe two months. There isn't really a disorder, and, you know. I need to be significant enough, I need to be bimonic, connected enough, that he feels safe enough that he can now tr transition to the world. He ended up in daycare and happy, and I've never heard from him since. Okay? That's really important. How does this feel for the kids you see? You're, you're, how many of you seen kids? One, two, three. Three of them. Okay. And these are young little pumpkins? How, are, what, how old are they? Okay. I just started seeing kids uh, yesterday, six and seven. Okay. And what, for, for, because of symptoms, I assume, you're part of it. Yeah, treatment center. Um, because it was a private practice, but because they had told their mom that they wanted to jump off a 40-foot wall at the oh, Wow, and I'm sorry, they are how old? Six and seven. Okay. Okay. So that's a very clear role as to why you're there. You're there for treatment. Yeah. How about you? The kid that I was seeing, um, because of divorce issues, the mom was, the kid was in the middle of it. You know, being pulled okay. apart between mom and dad. Mom wanted what dad wanted, and he was obviously acting out and being really defined and temper tantrums, and so we did a lot of um, just kind of play therapy. Because at first, he didn't want to be there. You know, he didn't want to be there at all. Of course. So it's just getting down on the ground and, and letting him do what he wanted to do. Because he wasn't allowed to do anything else. You show me the yeah, get, please. Oh. Um, I was seeing a seven-year-old boy who was said to be the terror of the school to the point where they had to actually remove the other kids from the classroom because he was acting out so badly. And when he would come to my office, I would have Lincoln Logs and other toys for him to play with there and these little figures. And he would not only be completely quiet and compliant and, and cooperative, but then he'd be so thrilled at the engagement that after he created some little scene with the toy to tell me all about it and to tell me the story behind it and what each of the characters was doing and what, you know, and, I, and I'm hearing on the one hand all this information from teachers and parents and so forth and seeing this child that seems 180 out from that and I'm trying to reconcile, well, what, what's the difference? What's going on here? I mean, what, what's this all about? Really well said. Kids in divorces, you well know, are caught in these between two cyclones, hurricanes, especially hostile divorces, and betrayals and loyalties and all that. Oh my God. Talk about a smorgasbord 
of limbic amygdalations. What do you do with all that? They have a safe and sheltered space to, safe and sheltered space to be able to manage any of that with somebody that you're connected to. You are a co-captain on a ship through an amazing storm. It's like life of pie. You're with that kid fighting the two tigers, and they need you. And the way if you want to be bimonic and you want to connect with a kid, whether it's being a healer in this disease disorder model, pool cleaner, or a music teacher that helps this kid learn skills in life, you're, and this kid is six or below, never mind eight or so, you're going to do that through being with them, through play. So let me define play for you. I sat around and thought, okay, since this is all about play therapy, this is way, way, way back. This is how I got to really define play. This is a excruciatingly non-parsimonious definition. <clears throat> oh, by the way, holidays and rituals, another way to express and strengthen our connection. Holidays and rituals are all about connecting, of course. Sorry? I said, do you need somebody to write a question? Thank you for remembering. Yes, are you volunteering? Thank you. Thank you. By the way, we can also be... Yeah. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm trying to remember. No, thank you. That's, I appreciate that. By the way, sometimes we feel closer to people, more connected to them, at afar than then when we're with them. Like online relationships, and you finally meet the person, you don't feel connected at all. And sometimes we're more connected in concept. You leave your spouse and you feel very connected when you're not with them. And you're with them, it's like, yeah, Because connection is internal. And sometimes the real person disrupts our internal schema of how it's supposed to be. Because they respond in ways that create a disconnection now. That fire our amygdala. Happens all the time. It's the weirdest thing. But you get long distance relationships, a lot of those that way. And then they move to the same town finally. and then Because it disrupts the schema we have. All right. It's complicated. Life is complicated. That's why it gets easier. Do you know about second life? Talk about that. Talk about connection. Second life is a whole universe of its own. You're an avatar. You go to secondlife.com. You, you create an avatar. And you relate to others. You, you chat with them as avatars. And it's become a huge thing. It has its own world, its own economies, its own cultures, its own things. And some people now are more attached to second life than first life, this life. This life becomes simply a means to support their second life. They get married in second life. They have sex in second life. There's, there's like porn areas there. That all the big companies, IBMs and whatnot, have little, of course, marketing comes into it, little sites. The Swedish embassy is also on second life. New York Times guy who was doing an article on second life created a little New York Times bureau on second life. It's a whole universe of itself. But some people are more connected there because it's easier to connect in this Cyber. There are therapists who do therapy on Second Life. There are folks who do classes on Second Life. You all meet. I know, it's a very strange world we live in. Yeah. This becomes a lost art, making yeah. real human contact. One of the ambivalences, frankly, about doing these tapes, it makes it easy for you not to come here. And instead, you could just watch the tape. I mean, I mean there's perfectly legitimate reasons. I, I understand that. I accept that. But there is a bind in that. But what I miss is your engagement. This is a dance. This happens together, we create together. <laughs> All right. Play, this misnomer, is, and it's such a long definition, I actually wrote it out. And intrinsically, by the way, I'm going to go through all of this slowly, intrinsically, and intrinsically motivated, intrinsically motivated activity. Obviously, anything's activity. Activity and language <laughs> embedded in a developmental stage by which the child communicates. I'm going to write a bunch of different words here, and you could add more. Manipulates. 
and explores her, his, relevant concerns. Again, we could add a bunch of words here. Perceptions. We're going to, yeah. Conceptions. Experiences. And, of course, feelings. Okay, let's, let's repeat for a second. Play is an intrinsically motivated activity in language embedded in a developmental stage by which the child communicates, manipulates, and explores her or his relevant concerns, perceptions, conceptions, experiences, and feelings with the possibility, possibility, ah, of resolving and expanding her, his way of managing and assimilating, a ah, big Piagetian word, assimilating such, and here comes psychology's favorite word, issues, ah, yes. such issues, issues. As well as, oh yes, developing, okay, and I'll read all this and we'll go through all this, learning, practicing, and mastering, mastering. new perceptions and concepts, comma, almost done, in a context that is understood to be make the leave. Play is an intrinsically motivated activity in language. It is embedded in a developmental stage by which the child communicates, manipulates, and explores her or his relevant concerns, her perceptions, conceptions, experiences, feelings, with the possibility of resolving, expanding her or his ways of manipulating and assimilating all these various things, issues, the perceptions, conceptions, whatnot, as well as developing, learning, practicing, mastering new perceptions, concepts, all in a context that is understood to be make, believe. Intrinsically motivated. You show me a little pumpkin that doesn't play, and I'll show you, and I'm not saying this in any rebuking way, but observationally, one sick cookie. You show me a kid who doesn't play and that child is, has got some significant neurobiological issues going on or unbelievable trauma shutdown. Whether it's severe autism kinds of stuff, whether it's severe schizophrenic issue, whatever you want to call that kind of something, huge is going on with a little pumpkin that doesn't what we call play. I would worry a lot about a child who doesn't Play. It's intrinsic. It's in the bioplasm of our being to play. You can't stop them. I had a new client the other day. Two sisters. I'm actually only seeing one. One of them is uh, five-ish. The other one is about three. Well, they all come in for the moment. Then both of them immediately at my office is very child-friendly. Lots of stuff. I have lots of Playmobil toys. All kinds of stuff all over the place. They immediately go to all that stuff. And there's a little pumpkin, the little tear, because she had to be lifted to leave. No, no, no! Taking away from playing. It's immediately what she wants to do. We try to talk to kids. <laughs> and all they're looking at is all their, the place. That they're, that's, what, that's how they engage. That's how they relate to the world. 
that's neurobiologically, intrinsically motivated. Obviously, it's an activity. It's a language. It's a way they speak. It's a way they express their schemas. It's a way they expand and develop their schemas. <coughs> you want to talk about that image I keep referring to, that kind of Pac-Man-ish image of self and the illusion of it? And it's these things that define the self. That's how the child defines themselves is through what we call play, this engagement. So they explore and communicate what's relevant to them, what they're worried about, how they see the world, how they conceive of it, how they put it together, what their experiences have been, obviously what they're feeling. And it's a means by which they can actually resolve and expand their way of conceiving, perceiving, feeling about this. It's a way, and the only way in some ways, <laughs> to learn and practice new identities, new ways of being. And the reason it all works is because it's a context that's understood to be make, buff, leave. They know it's really not really real. I'll give you an example. So I was seeing this little pumpkin whose mother had put her in scalding hot water, bathtub. Tortured her, basically. She was removed from the home as in foster care. Scars all over her little pumpkin legs, this little sweetheart. Let's see, office. First session. Here's the office. Come in the door here. This is Tom Rusk's office, my old office. So here's Tom's office, here's my office. Here's the hallway, here's a, like a, actually we had a secretary's area. A desk here. And we had a bathroom right here. And then we had a waiting room in the back here. Actually, there was another office there. Here's this waiting room. Well, as much as Judy Rust did a beautiful job of putting ferns and all kinds of nice stuff over the bathtub, there was a wooden thing and all that, and there was a sink here. This little pumpkin comes walking in. Do I happen, the bathroom door happened to be open. She sees the bathtub. Bathtub to her is an instrument of torture. Torture. Through one of these old fashioned bathtubs with the legs. That equals to her. Her schema of that is an instrument of torture. So when she saw that, just the bottom half of the bathtub, even though I had ferns and all this, she freaked out. Understandably. It was very real to her. Well, as you might imagine, over time, she was in a very nice foster care and whatnot, what did she start to play with a lot? What do you imagine? What objects of all my little toys that I had? A little miniature bathtub. She started putting little figures in the little miniature bathtub, a whole bunch of times, over and 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 over again. One of the things you have to be as a play therapist is very patient. Because I'll do the same thing over and over. And you know how they like to read the same story over and over and over and over, or watch the same video over and over. like to play the same theme over and over and over and over. If you're a pure humanistic therapist, you never tell. You'll let them do it over and over and over. I'm good for usually about five sessions of the same thing. And then I try, we'll talk about how, to see if maybe we're stuck. Maybe there's a little nudging that can happen. I do believe it's a co-endeavor, especially for bimonic. It's jamming. I can add a little melody riff if you like it, a little rhythm, let's change it up maybe, it's up to you. But the reason eventually, she by the way eventually started playing in the sink, and then we couldn't get her out of here, all she wanted to do was be in the sink. It was because she could start out with a toy bathtub because she knew it was make believe. Context that she knows to be make believe. Leave. By the way, by the time she was doing the sink, as you might imagine, I asked her first time if she started bathing yet. Not yet. The next time she came, she was couldn't get her out of the tub. Little squeaky dolls and the little rubber duckies, and she's probably one of the corporate heads of 
Bed Bath & Beyond. It wouldn't surprise me. Or what's the other one? The body shop, whatever it is. All those because it's a context that's understood to be make-believe, which you express and explore what's relevant to you. By the way, footnote, you know who knows what's make-believe or not? So I've shown you the picture of Seraphos, right? My dog way back when, and the two pups, the giant pups. When they were little pumpkins, little cutie pies, they would play fight, pretend fight, fight. Well, every once in a while, the hair would all go up, and all of a sudden they're like, Arr. and I thought, I gotta work it out. That was fine when they're little. It was not fine when they're 110 pounds in the back of my Jeep, and they're having that fight. Arr. And the whole Jeep is, and then Sarah was to get into it. It was unbelievable. And I had to pull over, try and find somebody's clothes. It was insane. And the rep said, you've got to snip them. <laughs> Talk about mirror neurons. <laughs> Over identification. <laughs> but I had to. He said, Oh, is he going to come home someday and you're going to find ears on the ground? They're going to eat each other. So I did, and they still got in the fight some. But they understood the context of what's make believe, what's pretend. I'm going to show you, I'll send you a nice little article on trans species play. Creatures play, they know that it's a context that's make believe, it's not really real. They know that. It's wonderful. Let me tell you sweetly and in short, because I think play is a misnomer. I was trying to figure out what, how do I call this? Play is the child engaged in self-creation. That's what play is. The child is engaged, and I mean neurobio, endrical, literally self-creation. It's the neurobio, psycho, endrico, all oh, scaffolding of human competence. Of human competence. The reason you can sit there and attend to whatever extent, or fake it well, to whatever extent now, is because play seduced you into paying attention, learning how to focus on something that was fascinating and keep your focus on it. If you hadn't played, you would not be able to be sitting here today. It's self-creation. That's really important. Mom, can I go self-create? Absolutely. It is so important that kids play. And I worry, as you know, about this. It's here to stay. I got it. I got it. I'm making apps, whatever. I got it. Every time I see a kid engaged in magic mind time, I think the species will survive. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I know we'll find creative ways of using this, but it is different. And we're spending a lot of time doing this. And little pumpkins, very, very little, are spending a lot of time. Thank God they still come into my office. And they, though they're in the waiting room now, they're doing this, more than looking at highlights or whatever. But when they come in, they, they are so into, thank God, self-creation, immersion. <laughs> in this thing that we call play. That's why Plato was right. Life must be lived as play. Because play is, even though he didn't say this, self-creation. He is absolutely right. The unexplored life is not worth living. You are creating yourself by what we call play. Okay? Food to think on. Go have a playful 